Okay, I'll take one and pass it around, please. I don't think I'm going to print material every week, but I will have the material on hand and available if you want it. You can send me your email address or shoot me a text or whatever to go, hey, I really like that lesson. Can you give me a note or whatever? I will have all of that available for you. But today we're just going to do an overview and hopefully we'll finish today. Hopefully. And so, thank you. We are going to uh, go over the book of Hebrews for the next however long it takes us to get through it. Um, there's 29 different pericopes in the book, so pericope being a section of scripture that includes an independent thought that builds upon themselves. And so there's 29 of those, roughly. We might combine some, we might have to split some up depending on the section. But, you know, given special days and stuff like that, I imagine we'll probably be in the next book, in this book, for like nine or ten months. And so, in light of that, I set out some goals that I think would help everybody if you know, it's optional. Like I said last week, we're not going to have a, uh, a poster with everybody's name on it and memory verses. And if you memorize it, you get a gold star next to it. And at the end, you get a $5 gift card to Chick-fil-A or something. We're not going to do that. If you want to, go for it. But I'm not mandating that. And so somebody else will need to make the poster. So if you want to, make the poster, put it up there. It's on you. But anyway, so the goals for Hebrew is something I think would really help all of us if we want to study it through together. Well, the first one, obviously, you have to read it. And Hebrews is 13 chapters, and it does not take that long to read. You can read two chapters a day in about five minutes. Even the longer chapters don't take that long. It reads very quickly. And so read through it once a week. You know, just set up a time in your daily Bible reading where you read two chapters a day, and on Sunday you read three, or however you want to do it. It's up to you. It would really help you. Um, on the back, I have all the pericopes listed. And so the second thing I would say is read the pericope each day and think about it. Look at it, find out, well, what's weird about this? Or, oh, that's really cool, or meditate on it. Try to get a grasp of it. So for example, the very next week, we're going to cover the exordium. Now, if you don't know what an exordium is, don't feel bad. I had no idea what it was until I read it in the book. I'm like, what? on earth is that. So an exordium is a fancy word for introduction. And since it's fancy, I like it. Anyway, it's four verses long. And there's more print dedicated to those four verses than any other pericope in the entire book. The four verses will introduce everything he's going to talk about in the book. It's really, really tightly packed. It's awesome. Anyway, so good number two on the, on the front of the page would be read and reflect on the upcoming pericope daily. And so I'll try to announce it at the end of class and then just read through it. Like the first one's four verses. Read through it during the day. It takes a minute. You know, think about it. Look up words. Do whatever you want to do with it. But that would also help you with the study. And then number three, consider memorizing some of it. And so what I did this last week is I read through the book. And I started highlighting different passages that, well, I like and I think are influential and I think that go well with the theme of the book and everything. And so I found bits and pieces from every chapter so you can go through it. So the first one, Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, and then Hebrews 2, 3, 4, all down the line, all the way 13. Some of them have, like, giant sections and others are just individual verses. But my suggestion to you is go through and try to memorize some of them. It would be helpful for you. And then number four, and this is something that we're going to get into as we teach through the book, try to consider what the author is doing with how he portrays Christ. And so a big theme in the book of Hebrews is the superiority, the qualitative excellence and greatness and transcendence of Christ. Over any other thing that he talks about, he shows how Christ is a fulfillment or is above that particular thing. And so all throughout the book, we're going to be discussing this. And so think about how the book of Hebrews portrays Christ. So the first one, the big section in chapter 1 and 2, and it's interwoven throughout the rest of the book, but it really focuses on it in the first two chapters, is Jesus Christ's son. And that's something only Christ can claim. Only Jesus is the son of God. Only Jesus is the son of man. Now, we all can say that we're sons of God in a 
in a different sense. We can all say we're sons of men, or we're called sons of men in a different sense. But only Jesus is the Son of God and the Son of Man. And so that's primarily chapters 1 and 2. And also, the author draws heavily off of Psalm, chap off of Psalm 2. And so consider how he is presenting Christ. So in the very first pericope, for example, Christ is the source of all revelation. Christ is the heir of all things. Christ is the creator of all things. Christ is the one who reconciled us to God by purging our sins. And there's more in there than just that. But just off the first three verses, there's that to think about. Think of Christ as the Son of God. So the second pericope, when he starts talking about comparing Christ to angels, you have verses 5 through 14 in chapter 1. It, it gives that comparison. It talks about how Christ is the Son of God above the angels. And then in chapter 2, after the first warning section in verses 5 through 18, he talks about how Christ is the Son of Man who was made a little bit lower than the angels. And so it's really interesting how he starts comparing these things. And so start thinking about how the book presents Christ. And then once you get to chapter 3 all the way through the end of chapter 7, it starts talking about Christ as high priest. And so it covers different, different aspects of what it means to be a high priest and the difference between Christ as high priest and the Old, Old Testament Levitical high priesthood and the offerings that they offered and how things overlap and are the same, but how Christ is qualitatively superior to anything that they could have offered. And so over there, it talks about Christ's faithfulness. It talks about his suffering and his perfection. It talks about his eternal priesthood. And then lastly, and there's more, we'll cover each one in the pericopes, Think about how Christ is presented as the mediator of the new covenant. And so I think we all understand that God interacts with us based off of covenants. So from the very get-go in Genesis chapter 1, well, actually in chapter 2, God's interacting with Adam, and God makes a covenant with him. He says, all this stuff over here, have at it. Eat as much as you want, as often or little as you want. It's all for you, but this one tree, don't, do, don't eat of that. And if you do, you will surely die. And that's the covenant he makes with Adam. And that's how he interacts with Adam. And what happens, Adam eats the fruit, and he surely dies. And so God's constantly interacting with man based off of the covenants that he makes with them. And so when you're reading through the Old Testament, you're like, God, why on earth are you judging us this weird, abstract way? It doesn't make any sense. You go back, you read Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and see God saying, if you do this, this is what I'm going to do. You can match it with what God says with God's judgment. You go, oh, God's judging him here because this is what they're not doing in the covenant that he made with them. And well, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant for us. And so we are not under the stipulations of the Old Testament, co Old Testament covenants, in certain respects anyways, but we're under the stipulations of the new covenant. So our responsibility to God is based off of that covenant that he makes with us when we get saved, through Christ. And so consider Christ as the mediator of the new covenant. What does that mean? Well, his sacrifice for our sins was perfect and eternal. He said he offered himself once. Because if you look at the Old Testament, he prays they had to offer themselves again, and again, and again, and again. Why? Because they were constantly sinning, and none of their offerings could make anyone perfect. So they constantly had to re-offer, 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 re-offer. Well, Christ offered himself once and sat down. He's done. He doesn't have to come back and do it again. And so he's got a better, a better offering. Um, consider that his death means an eternal inheritance for us. Because if a person that makes a will with you is alive, is a will under any force when the person who made, wrote the will is alive? No, like if your parents have an inheritance for you, do you get that while you're alive? No, they have to die first. Well, it's the same thing with Christ. This is heavily emphasized in chapter 7 and 8, well, or 9, I think. But you don't get the inheritance unless the testator dies. And so Christ had to die for us to obtain that eternal inheritance that God wants for us. A sacrifice for sin had to be paid. And then number three, his offering was only necessary once. This isn't something that has to be done over and over and over and over again. What that means is that our sin penalty, once we receive Christ, everything we did from the get-go of our life to the end of our life, all of that's paid off at once. All of it. One time. There's no need to constantly re offer sacrifice or anything. He's dealt with it. So Christ is qualitatively superior of a better covenant. And then I put the five warning sections of Hebrews down at the bottom of the page. And so the way Hebrews is structured, and we'll get into this in a moment, is the author will start giving you an aspect of Christ that you need to consider, talking about how Christ is superior in some certain way, and then he's going to launch into a warning section. And so one author says he goes from thesis or setting out propositions that you need to believe over to paradesis, which basically means counsel or advice. So he sets out what you should believe, and then he gives you a warning about it. 
And then he'll set out what you need to believe and then give you another warning. And he has five warnings throughout the book. And his warnings and how you interpret them basically will govern how you interpret the book of Hebrews. All right, so go ahead and turn over to the back. And so the back is just the perik piece, and I borrowed this heavily. In fact, I copied it to give credit where credit is due. I borrowed it heavily from a gentleman named David Allen, and his commentary on Hebrews is phenomenally good. It's excellent. And so this is a cut and paste. Well, I did cut. I typed it out, but it's basically copied from him. And so if you want to get, I'll discuss books here in a moment, but this is what we're going to follow, give or take. We're gonna, there's going to be a little bit of wiggle room because we may or may not cover each pericope or whatever, but we'll follow this to the best that we can. That way you know what to study or what to think about, what to meditate on, what to memorize even as we go through the book. And so that is yours to keep, use it, lose it, do whatever you want with it. It's fine. I won't be upset, I promise. Anyway, so books. So what I am using to study, some of it, and there's more, it's, there's not any particular reason. If you want a small book, you can get William Barclay's book, Letter to the Hebrews. This is a very quick read. It's been pretty helpful. It's been pretty good. It's not as in-depth as I would like, but it's not going to hurt you. And then you've got this one, which a friend of mine recommended from Kent Hughes. It's Hebrews, an Acre for the Soul. Hi, Levi. one or two but there you go. anyway so this is another relatively shorter read that's been good um and then the two chunk books uh we're biblical um this comes at it from a slightly different angle than the next book i'm going to pull out but there's a lot of overlap of conclusions and so this has been a good read. If you like to get into the nitty gritty on textual things and whatnot, this is very helpful for you. Um, if you're not solid on where your Bible comes from and things like that, I would caution you a little bit against it. So if you're going to read it, come at it from a perspective that you're already comfortable with the Bible means what it says and that you're confident in its origin and everything else. If you're not confident in that, don't get where biblical because they will, they get really heavy into textual criticism. And then this one's basically of the books that I have. This one's the one I was just talking about um, on the back of your sheets, all the pericopes I borrowed that. I got that straight out of this. Um, this has been really good. It's really chunky. Like, it's not an easy read. And I like to read. This is not an easy read. But this is really good. It's been absolutely phenomenal to read so far. So if you want to look at those, write them down or whatever, I will... Uh, have these here. I just wanted to show you that way. If you're like, hey, Patrick, I really want to read something extra as I'm going through to help me. Those are what I'm using, and those will help you. All right, now let's get into the part you don't have. Part I have here. We're going to go into the setting, and then we're going to talk about the structure a little bit, and then we will be done. So, who wrote the book of Hebrews? Anyone? James. Luke. Okay, we have Luke. <laughs> Anyone else? Paul God. slash Timothy. Huh? Paul slash Timothy. Paul slash Timothy. Somebody said God. I'm not going to write that up here. <laughs> Anyone else? Peter and John up there What do you say? Peter and John. Peter and John? I haven't read that one. Cover all the bases. Okay. Most of the people, sometimes you'll see Apollos. I think there was an argument I read for Barnabas. But basically the strongest arguments you'll have are Paul or Luke. Um, most people within our circle, when they preach through Hebrews, they'll go, the author Paul, the author Paul, the author Paul, the author Paul, the author Paul. And so they'll beat it into your head that Paul wrote the book. The book doesn't actually tell you who wrote it. it. It doesn't tell you who wrote it. And so what you have to do is read and discern and go into super levels of textual analysis that none of us possess the qualifications for because we're not Greek scholars. And honestly, it, it's not terribly important who wrote it. 
this is my personal conviction. I believe Luke wrote it. We're going to go with Luke. Pastor thinks Luke wrote it. The best argument I read is that Luke wrote it. Um, if you go to chapter 2 real quick, and we'll cover this in a few weeks. If I can find Hebrews. There we go. So chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. How shall we, so the person writing includes himself in the statement, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? Okay, so you have one, you have group, you have two groups now. You have we, so the group including the author. Then you have another group, the Lord. So I'll write this down. I guess I am going to write on the board today. So you have we, you have the Lord, and if you keep reading, began, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, it was confirmed unto us by who? And so you have another group. Them that heard him. Okay, and what does it say about them that heard him? God also bearing with them witness, this is group two, both with what? Signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So the them that heard him are the guys that are doing all the miracles and everything else. So who is this group? The apostles. Okay, so if this is the apostles, who is in this group? Paul. Paul. So if Paul is in this group of the people that are doing the miracles, he's not part of this group of the people that are hearing and watching and bearing witness. Now, that's not obviously conclusive evidence. I'm not saying this is foolproof. But just from my own personal conviction reading those verses at the moment, I don't think the author is Paul. But again, that's not conclusive evidence beyond the reason of a doubt. So take what we will, but we will go ahead and go with the author being Luke. And that's probably never going to come up again the rest of the time we teach the book. <laughs> because it's just not terribly important. I just, I'm not convinced that it's necessary for us to get in a fuss about it. Like we all believe Hebrews is in the Bible. We all believe the Bible is inspired. And if we believe the Bible is inspired, that everything in the Bible is inspired, that would also include the book of Hebrews, whoever wrote it. But for the sake of whatever, we'll just go with Luke. All right. Oh, who is he writing to? So we don't know who wrote it. We don't know who the audience was either. It doesn't tell you. Because when Paul ever, when Paul writes, he goes, Paul, an apostle to the churches at Galatia, or to Timothy, my son, or any number of other things. He always identifies himself and says who his audience is. The book of Hebrews doesn't do that. The book of Hebrews does not do that. But if you read through the book, you get some clues. And so the first clue you could get is the audience that he was writing to really knew their Bibles. Like they are completely fluent in the Old Testament. And you might go, well, Patrick, why do you think that? Patrick, why do you think that? Thank you. <laughs> well, the reason I think that is the book is replete full of Old Testament quotations without any explanation. Like if you read through the first chapter, I think you have eight or nine references to Psalms alone in the first chapter. First chapter is 14 verses. And if, if you go through the entire Old Testament, you will, or the entire book of Hebrews, you'll basically find that the author goes through pretty much the entire Old Testament. And so he talks about how Christ is better than the angels. And then he quotes different things about what the angels' ministry was versus what Christ's ministry was, his son. Then in verse 2, he talks about Christ being the son of man and how Christ was made a little bit lower than the angels, which is another quotation from Psalms. In chapter 3, he starts talking about Christ and Moses. And he starts talking about Christ and Israel and our response to Christ versus Israel's response to God. And he starts talking about the Levitical priesthood. He starts talking about covenant. He starts talking about the Melchizedekian priesthood. And then in Hebrews 11, he talks about every single prominent Old Testament saint that we all want to emulate. And so he's constantly referencing the Old Testament, which would make no explanation for anything that he references. He builds doctors out of it, but doesn't explain the text. Well, why would you do that unless you're writing to a people that already understood your, what you're talking about? 
Does that make sense? Like if I learn a whole bunch of Greek and I come in here and, and I start talking Greek to all of you, is that going to help anybody? No, why? Because you don't know Greek. And so you have to communicate on a register that the other person is familiar with, and if you don't, you have to explain what you're saying. Therefore, one clue that we could get about the audience is they were probably extremely knowledgeable in the Old Testament. Another clue, and this one's important, the second one is important. This is going to dictate how you interpret the entire book. I'm going to pro propose that the audience is a group of people who are already saved. Now, your view on that is going to change every single one of the warning sections and how you interpret those. So are the warning sections talking about people who are close to professing but about to turn away and therefore really aren't saved? And so the warning is, hey, you need to go ahead and confirm your salvation because you are not saved, and if you reject God, then all these things are going to happen to you. And if you look at the warning sections, they're terrifying for one, and two, they do seem to indicate that. But I'm going to tell you that they're believers. And the reason why I think this is important is because you cannot interpret the warning sections in two different ways. You can't say, okay, there's one interpretation for the unbeliever, and there's one interpretation for the believer. You can't do that. If there's only one interpretation for every text. Now, you might be able to apply it to unbelievers, and I think that wouldn't be unfair. But you can't interpret it as meaning one thing to one and one thing to another. Otherwise, anybody can go and interpret any text as meaning whatever they want to whomever they want. You can't do that. And so here are some of the reasons why. And again, you're welcome to your own conclusion here. But this is how we're going to go through the book. If you go to Hebrews 5, we're not going to get finished with the introduction today. I was hoping we would, but we're not going to. Go to Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5, verse 11 states, of whom, and he's talking about Melchizedek here, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, say you are dull of hearing. He's calling them all hard of hearing. For when the time that ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. But, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so this is a group of people that he thinks should already be teaching. And due to their own slothfulness, which you can find it, you know, in verse 12 of chapter 6, due to their own slothfulness, they have not pursued maturity and are, it's either an ironic, sarcastic statement to them where it's saying this is where you should be, but you're not, or it's an honest statement saying this is where you should be, but you're not. Well, unbelievers aren't ever in a place where they can be, grow to become teachers. And so that's one argument I have for it. And if you look at Hebrews 6, 1, 2, 3, the author does not plan to teach them the first principles of the doctors of Christ again. If they were unsaved, that's exactly what he would be doing. And then he moves on with his discourse. If you look at Hebrews 6, 9 through 12, it kind of paints a picture of a group of people that have previously worked and labored for God. I'll read that. So verse 9, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget what? your work and labor of love, which you have showed towards his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And so he's saying God's not going to forget your work of labor and love. And that indicates a group of believers in my mind. And then lastly, in Hebrews 10, 23, it tells, it tells the believers to hold fast your profession of faith, which that doesn't make any sense in the context of the books written on believers. What profession are they supposed to hold on to? It says, let us gather together, let us encourage each other, let us provoke yourselves into good works. None of that makes sense to an unbelieving audience. And so those are just a few of the reasons. And again, you're welcome to make up your own mind. None of this is dogmatically set in stone. But those are just a few of the reasons. And there's more. Um, number three as to who the audience is, they were probably Jews steeped in the Septuagint. And so this can be sticky in, in certain circles that we uh, run in. But if you look at the, all the Old Testament quotations in the book of Hebrews, they don't come from the Hebrew Old Testament. So the Hebrew Old Testament was, it's called the Masoretic Text, it's written in Hebrew. And the King James Bible, well, I think most Bibles really are translated from the Masoretic Hebrew Text. 
Well, the author of Hebrews is quoting from the Hebrew text. He's quoting from what's called the Septuagint. And what the Septuagint is, is a Greek translation of the Hebrew text that came about, I don't know what, 100 years before Christ, 200 years before Christ. And so he's quoting from that. And so that indicates a group of Jewish people that are not actually in Israel, or they may not be in Israel, but they've been heavily exposed to the Old Testament Greek translation, because that's where all of his quotations come from. And so since it's a group of people that know the Old Testament very well, and he's quoting from the Septuagint, which would have been something that the non-Israelite non Jews or Jews not living in Israel would have heavily used, then the conclusion follows, in my mind at least, that they were probably Jews. The audience was probably Jews, very knowledgeable and steeped in Septuagint. And so the, con the constant references to the nation of Israel, their patriarchs, their heroes, the temple, the sacrifices, without any explanation indicates a group that already is very familiar with that, which would indicate a primarily Jew Jewish audience. And number four, this group had probably been believers for a while. And so the reason I think that's good at Hebrew stat. Hebrews 10, verse 32, it says, But call to remembrance the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions, partly while you were made a gazy stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while she became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Now, this is a group of people that's already dealt with persecution before. They've already dealt with it. They've already experienced a, a bout of persecution. And so this probably isn't a group of newly saved believers who haven't experienced any of that yet. And then if you look in Hebrews 12, which we don't need to turn to, this is probably a group that's anticipating an upcoming soon to occur persecution. It talks about them not resisting unto blood, like they haven't suffered bloodshed for what they believe at this point in time. So this is a group that is primarily Jewish, very knowledgeable in the Old Testament, been saved for a while, and they are looking at a, at a time of upcoming persecution, and they are wavering. And so this whole book's written as an encouragement to the wavering to continue fast in Christ. So what's the thrust of the book, the main theme? And the main theme of the book is the quali qualitative superiority of Christ and how believers should respond in light of it. And so the book shows Christ being the source of fulfillment of revelation, reconciliation, and restoration, which is going to happen is when he establishes his kingdom. It depicts him as the son of God instead of man, by nature above angels, above Moses, greater than the Aaronic and Levitical priesthoods, and the mediator of a better covenant. So this book's thrust is Christ is qualitatively superior. He's better. And the main issue which you will get through reading the warning passages and certain others, is the audience appears to be a group that seems to be withdraw withdrawing. So this is a group that is wavering in their convictions to Christ. And the author sees that and is recognizing it, is concerned about it. So his solution to the people that are wavering is, here is Jesus. Like, you want, you were wavering, maybe turning to something else, or you were wavering, maybe withdrawing, well, here's Christ. Here's Christ, here's his superiority, here's everything that he has done, and therefore, follow Christ. Follow Christ. You know, if Christ is superior, then your faith in Christ should also rise to that level. And so the author motivates him through examples, motivates his audience through examples in the Old Testament where Israel acted in unbelief. You can look at Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 about that one. And he shows them that since Christ is superior, then our response of unbelief demands greater punishment. In other words, if the people who heard the law and saw the miracles that God did back then spent 40 years wandering the wilderness because they didn't believe and they all died there, and God was grieved at their unbelief, how much greater of a punishment should believers be thought to be guilty of if we take Christ who has saved us from our sins and purged us of all unrighteousness and gotten us an inheritance, an eternal inheritance in heaven, and is going to redeem the entire world and set up his kingdom here, how much of greater punishment should we be thought worthy if we take a look at that, we get saved, we look all of, the, all of that, and we cast it behind our back? Now that's scary because you're like, but believers can't lose their salvation, and we can't lose our salvation, which is a beautiful, wonderful thing, because if we could, we would have already. But anyway, so if Christ is superior than everything in the Old Testament, that being a certain amount of punishment, 
that if Christ is superior to that, then our response also needs to be superior. And so he encourages them to take more earnest heed. So in chapter 2, the first warning section, take more earnest heed to the words of Christ. He motivates them not to fall short by acting in unbelief, which is the warning section, chapter 4. He motivates them again in chapter 6 to move on to perfection and not be slothful. And in chapter 10, he motivates them to continue assembling together, exhorting each other, provoking each other to good works. So basically, as Christians, we have a greater responsibility because our Christ is greater. Does that make, does that make sense? And so all of the warning passages tell you what the author is concerned about. He's concerned about a group of people that are going to fall short, a group of people that are going to start going into unbelief, a group of people that are being slothful and not pursuing maturity, a group of people that are maybe neglecting to assemble, people that are neglecting to exhort each other and encourage each other to band together because they're looking at potential upcoming persecution going, we've already dealt with this, but we don't want to go through this again. Possibly. The thesis statement. I think, and this is personal opinion without any proof, so I'll... I'll throw this out there. Personal opinion without any actual proof at the moment. That the thesis statement is probably Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. And so we can read that. Because in my mind, it sums up everything that he's talked about. And it says, Wherefore, saying we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which thus so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied of faith in your minds. And so that sums up Hebrews 1 through 11 beautifully. So that's a good thesis statement. We'll run with it. And so basically what I have right here is with all the evidence at hand and with the witnesses that have gone on before, so both the good witnesses and the bad witnesses, which he's covered in the first 11 chapters, let us lay aside every weight in sin and run, with, run our races with patience looking to Jesus. So running our race in light of the book means properly responding to Christ who speaks through his word, responding to it in faith, and moving on to maturity and assembling together to encourage and provoke each other. And so therefore... The danger they were facing, because y'all might be thinking, I'm not a mature believing Jew. So the book of Hebrews is not written to me. Are, are there any mature believing Jews? No. Okay. So this book's not written to any of us, so we can just pack up and go home, right? Nobody's going to go for that one. Okay, you're all laughing at me, though. And so, but we are a group of believers that struggle with hearing God's word. We are a group of people that struggle with unbelief. We are a group of people that struggle in slothfulness and not growing spiritually. We are a group of people that are looking ahead at a future persecution and are unsure of what's going to happen. We are a group of people that need to come together and motivate each other and encourage each other to stay faithful, right? Yeah. I have some very stoic looks. I'm sorry, Calvin, I'm not looking at you. Do you feel left out? I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you right now. <laughs> Anyway, and so the dangers that they were facing are applicable to us today. And so we might not be facing imminent persecution. We see the clouds on the horizon. Additionally, there are all sorts of things in life that cause us to be slothful in the Lord's work. So whether we were recently saved and we don't know anything yet or we're learning, or we're somebody who's been saved a long time but we're basically a baby and we don't know anything, or we're someone who can teach and we've built up our skills and we've used or forgotten in the past but we're no longer doing that now, this book is for you. And so we have a couple minutes. I'm going to go over the structure really, 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 really quick. And then we'll actually make it through the introduction. And so the book of Hebrews is a sermon. And so this book, as far as I could tell, was designed for somebody to get up and read it orally. And the Greek, which we won't get into and I don't even know enough about to get into, it has all kinds of things that would make sense if it was if it was read out loud. And so he has alliteration, he has conclusio, he's got chiasm, we'll discuss all that stuff later. He's got all of these wonderful things that would be great for oration. And so this was a book that was meant to be delivered to somebody for somebody to stand up and read the whole thing in its entirety to a specific group of people. So this is a sermon. And so it has in a sermon what you would expect in a sermon. It has an introduction. It's got a bunch of thesis. It's got a bunch of propositional truths for you to believe, and it's got a bunch of application. 
And so what this, what he does, shut up phone, nobody asked you. What he does is he alternates between what's called thesis and paranesis. And so thesis, how I'm going to use the word, is going to be propositional truth. In other words, those are truths about Christ that he lifts up, and then he'll switch into paranesis, which is his counsel, or what we'll call the warning sections. So in light of the truth he has listed, this is the danger that you are facing. And this is the motivation for you to continue on in Christ. And so if you look at uh, the pericopes, um, next week we'll cover verses 1 through 4 in the first chapter. It's called the Exordium, or Introduction for Us. Um, it divides itself neatly into three sections. Uh, verses, or chapter 1, verse 5, through chapter 4, verse 13, starts talking about the purity of Christ as Son. Uh, the second section goes from chapter 4, verse 14, through chapter 10, verse 18, which is the obligation of Jesus' priestly office and his saving work. And that's where he talks about Christ as high priest and Christ as the mediator of our covenant and what a sacrifice means in light of everything you read in the Old Testament and how it's superior. And then verse or section 3, which is chapter 10, 19 through 13, 21, where he gives all of the exhortations. So exhorts us to draw near, to hold fast, to love one another, on and on and on and on. And then the last four verses are the conclusion. And so if you all would read um, the exordium next week, it's four verses. You can read it every day in a minute. Think about it, meditate on it. If you want to read through the book of Hebrews weekly, great, go for it. I have memory verses down here if you want to work on those. Yes, it's a lot of work, but you get into you get out of things what you put into them. And so that's all up to you how much effort you want to put into it. But we'll get through the book of Hebrews over the next 9, 10, however long it takes us, months. And hopefully we'll be better off after the end of it. All right, you all are dismissed. <laughs>